minutes, Ken Cord, is it? Well, that's up to yourself. Five minutes, it says here, yeah. OK. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this important strategy. Youth justice is something I've worked on for well over 15 years. In 2007, I published with Eamor Meehan the National Study on the Children Court on behalf of the Association for Criminal Justice Research and Development, profiling the young people who were before the Children Court. And I raise it because the children in 2007, it is the same 7 and 8% of children today um, who <clears throat> we know are most likely to become serious offenders. They're also the children most at risk in the state. They have, they have a shorter life expectancy, they're exposed to violence, they're more likely to commit violent acts, more likely to end up in prison. So they're the children most likely to commit offences, but they're also extremely vulnerable children at this stage. These aren't my concerns alone, but those better articulated by people like Eddie Darcy, who's worked in youth work for 30 years, and Chief Superintendent Colette Quinn, who's run the Garda Diversion Project now for, well, for many, many years, two of the most experienced and committed people in Ireland to help children stay out of the criminal justice system and move into appropriate welfare-based um, referral pathways. Uh, and I'm honoured to have worked closely with both of those for over five years on the committee to monitor the effectiveness of the youth diversion programme. Thankfully, both of those excellent people were on the steering group for this uh, strategy, and I'm very glad that they were. It's a welcome strategy. What needs to be addressed, though, is around implementation. There are things that we need to make happen because we've always dealt with this through youth offending, through crime only. I'd prefer it to be looked at from a more hybrid health perspective, not just a crime justice issue, but to see it as a welfare issue. And we need to change that that narrative in the public mind, in media and with victims. We need to be focused very much on restorative justice and ensuring that victims are brought into the process. Where we see that their needs are met way beyond their expectations within that process. When we do a really good restorative process, victim needs are really far better met. We also need to look at vetting. We have a lacuna in the legal environment where potentially every child subject to diversion could be subjected to vetting down the road. The whole purpose of diversion is to give them a safe place, a clean slate. But we find down the road that vetting legislation has taken no account of the Children Act, and those children go on to find when they come to apply to become a teacher or a social worker, for example, they meet the challenge of vetting. Um, and that becomes, these are, issues, these are issues because the alleged crime was never tested to the criminal standards because of the diversionary approach. And it doesn't take into account their age at the time, including the fact that they have a lesser capacity. So why are we committing them to a vetting standard of an adult when the incident occurred when they were a child? Two other areas of, of significant concern, the impact of social media on young people. The Child Trafficking and Pornography Act is totally unsuitable. Um, it was developed at a time looking at adults grooming children, but it doesn't, didn't provide for developments in social media. And it's a you know, it's not a great piece of legislation looking at the issues day in, day out. For example, one case I'm aware of from my work in youth justice involved a boy and girl around, aged around 12, 13, who had a quasi-sexual encounter. For all intents and purposes, it was a, an exploratory thing. It wasn't an issue of grooming or coercive control. It was more so a matter of a night out, inappropriate drink taken. But because of mandatory reporting, a whole other issue that needs to be contextualised, it was referred to the Guardi eventually, and the Guardi are mandated to investigate. The young people accepted responsibility. They were involved in the Guardi Youth Reversion Programme. And let's say later, they both grow up to train to become teachers. The girl goes to vetting, no issue. The boy goes to vetting, and his application is held up because of this matter. And it is actually a serious risk. Guardi are well capable of deciding based on risk factors, which cases are age and stage behaviour and which are actually criminal matters. And it, the current legislation is really too blunt an instrument so that kids in the diversion programme are included in the vetting programme later on. It's done to a civil standard, not a criminal standard. And people are being admitted to a programme based on no legal advice and admitting to something really because they fear if they go to court, they'll get a conviction. And then they later face challenges with vetting. We need in particular to look at the 18 to 24 year old cohort. We need to be, neuroscience has taught us so much and we need to be much more attuned to this um, age and behaviour. Again, because we know this is the most at risk group. And while, you know, and I'll just skip through, you know, what we're finding is that we're picking up children at 16 where they're already involved in very serious offending living very chaotic lifestyles and it's way too late we need to identify those people at a younger stage like I welcome the Guard Youth Diversion Programme working with children at a younger age but we do need to be careful about how that's worded how that's approached we don't need slippage you know moving away from those children who are actually committing the more serious offences um, there's a strong link as we know between exclusion from formal schooling and moving into serious offending I know uh, when D David Stanton was a minister he was very concerned about that I know there's a review of the timetables and suspensions in the youth just strategy but I'd like to see 
it much stronger. There's a very clear link between exclusion from the formal schooling system and those people that end up in the criminal justice system. The threshold is changing. The cohort that are the most serious offenders often move out of education at a very early age. Obviously, convincing schools to hang on to those young people is hard, and they may need extra resources to do that. But at some point, youth services and schools give up, and they hand the cases to the Garda Youth Diversion Programme. The services often withdraw. So, for example, one case involved a young people, a person who was homeless and in drug addiction. Every service had already withdrawn by the time the child was 13. The only one who hadn't was the guardian because they, they can't withdraw. So the strategy is about integrated approaches rather than just a justice approach. And it's about ensuring that mechanisms are put in place to ensure that support is not withdrawn just because they have become the responsibility of the Garda Youth Diversion Project. For many years, and as I've said before in this House, the Monitoring Committee was calling for a social worker based in the, the, the office, the Garda office, because in many cases we were seeing ref welfare referrals made, but not necessarily um, followed up. I'm, I think I'm over time for my colleagues. My apologies. <laughs>